have a question for you. Have you ever had the urge to do a good deed? You ever felt that urge to give to a special cause? You know, sometimes maybe you're watching TV and they, they have one of those infomercial things, you know, and they're showing little children in, the, in a destitute country, uh, poor and so on and so forth, and they're, they're trying to raise money to help these kids and you just, you feel so bad, you know, you just, I got to do something, you know, write a check and you send it out there or you call. You, know, you just have the urge to do something. Or maybe a young guy comes to our congregation here, young couple deciding they're going into the mission field and they're going to, I don't know, South America or Africa or somewhere, you know, they're going somewhere and they're enthusiastic and they, they love the Lord and they're going to preach the gospel and they're full of idealism and full of the Lord, you know, and you say to yourself, well, I want to help the, I've got the urge, I'm going to write those kids a check, you know. We get that urge, don't we? The urge to help, the urge to give, the urge to sacrifice ourselves, that urge, that impulse is actually hardwired into our souls by God because we are made in His image. He's like that. He has the urge to do what's right and good and lovely and gracious. We're like that too. Part of us is like that. The Bible tells us over and over again how God is moved by love and compassion to rescue and help His people. That passage in John 3, 16, for God so, that word so, He so loved the world, had to do something. It was part of His, part of his character. So it's no surprise that um, as His creation, we're also subject to the same kind of benevolent and sacrificial urges. As Christians, we experience these same kinds of feelings. You know, to, we want to help, we want to serve in regards to others, but we also have an additional desire not shared by unbelievers. Okay? And that is the urge to give to God. We also have that urge as well. This is a very important facet of our spiritual nature and one which God uses in order to help us mature in Christ Jesus. Now an example of this was the set of rules used to guide God's people when they were moved to give something to God. God gave some guidelines for when that would happen. And these were given so that a person who was moved to give to God would not inadvertently insult God by giving the wrong thing or giving to God in the wrong way, or perhaps offend God by promising a gift or a service that would have to be taken back because it was beyond a person's ability to actually give it. So there were rules for the giving, the urge to God that guided individuals. And I'd like to review some of these rules in order to guide that giving urge that we have today. Now in Leviticus, Moses outlines the various laws and regulations that guided a person when that person chose to give something or devote something to the Lord. For example, and this, this one sample here is, is in Genesis, I'll read it for you, but for example, um, the issue of the tithe, to tithe a part of the land and tithe the animals. In Genesis chapter 28, Jacob is saying, making a prayer here, and it says, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone which I have set up as a pillar will be God's house and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. And so here in Genesis we see God receiving a tenth of the produce of the land and animals as a first offering of the land. Now the idea was that if a person gave the first tenth to God, then 90% that he kept for himself would be blessed for his own use. The first tenth could not be dedicated or devoted to God because God already claimed it 
It was man's duty to give it. It was not offered as a gift. You know, a lot of times we have this false idea. You know, in the Old Testament, you know, uh, they gave a tenth. That was their offering. That was not their offering. That was not their offering. They had to give that. That was the law. There was like a tax, if you wish. In Israel, the first tenth was used to maintain the place of worship, support God's ministers, care for the needs of the poor. These things could be given as they were, or their cash value plus a fifth was given in their stead. And I want you to keep that in mind about that tithe. We'll get back to that in a minute. Then there was the law concerning the offering of the firstborn. Now, this was done in remembrance of the time when God spared the firstborn of the Jews, but destroyed every Egyptian firstborn, you know, the Passover. After this, the Lord required that each male firstborn be dedicated to Him thereafter. In other words, every firstborn male automatically belonged to God. He couldn't be given, he couldn't be offered, he automatically belonged to God. Now in the same way as the tithe on the land, the Jews gave a cash gift as a way of redeeming the firstborn. They were giving the firstborn, but they weren't actually sacrificing the child. They were giving it symbolically to God because they recognized that the first male born belonged to, it belonged to him. Okay? And instead they would give a cash a cash gift to redeem the child. It was their way of offer, unlike the pagans who would uh, sometimes uh, sacrifice their children in the fire, the Jews didn't do that. They redeemed the children with a, um, a cash uh, offering. The third set of rules were given concerning what was called the votive offerings. And that's where we get to Leviticus chapter 27. That's where you need to be, we're going to read in a minute. In Leviticus 27, Moses explains that there were times that the Jews wanted to give more than the tithe and more than God required as His. Their gratitude and joy moved them to offer or to vow something or someone to God for His, for his use. So this votive offering, this over and above the tithe, this could be produce, it could be animals, it could also be a child or a wife or a person's home, something valuable. And so in Leviticus 27, Moses established a monetary value for these things so that a person in a burst of spiritual enthusiasm who had devoted a child or his home to the Lord could substitute a cash gift in its stead. Okay, you following? So let's read Leviticus 27, just the first few verses to see how this was explained. It says, again, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when a man makes a difficult vow, difficult, that idea of difficult means a, 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 a vow that, is, that goes beyond the tithe, beyond what he normally has to give, okay? When he makes a difficult vow, he shall be valued according to your valuation of persons belonging to the Lord. If your valuation is of the male from 20 years, even to 60 years old, then your valuation shall be 50 shekels of silver after the shekel of the sanctuary. And he goes so on and so forth. He names different things, people, what the valuation was. In this way, a person could both experience the joy of giving something very precious, that word difficult could also be translated as precious. A person could give something very precious to the Lord and at the same time maintain the life and the possession of His offering. So by offering the value of the thing vowed, you vicariously offered that thing, that person itself. In other words, in a burst of, of, of desire to give to God, you, you vow your house. God, I love you so much, you've been good to me, my house is yours. You know? Well, he wouldn't have to actually break the house down and, you know, and, 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 and offer it on an altar. He would give the value of the house. To God, or I give my, my you know, certain animals, or I, I offer my child, my second and third child, uh, and so on and so forth. Well, these things all had monetary values. So you could get both. You could, in a burst of enthusiasm, be extremely generous and want to give God something, but at the same time retain the use, 
retain the life of the things that you offered by substituting the cash value of that person or things. So this provided guidelines and it provided protection for the natural desire of believers to give something precious to the Lord, something beyond what was required. The tithe, that was required. That was like income tax, you know, you, that's required. Not, are you doing the government a favor? No, it's the law, you got to give. 15% you know, of your income or 30, or, you know, no matter how much money you make. Well the tithe, that, that was required. That was, oh, I think I'm going to give the tithe. No, 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 no. Everybody gave the tithe. It was required. We're talking here about above and beyond the tithe. Those were the things here that were regulated. So for the one who wanted to go the second mile in his or her giving, God showed him how to do this in a proper way. Now, there was another set of regulations that provided instruction for the most devoted level of giving. Yes, there was even a level beyond the votive level, even beyond this, and that was called the most holy vow or the most holy offering. The cherim, as it was called. The cherim were those things vowed or offered to God for which there remained no power of redemption. They were what was referred to as most holy. In other words, so absolutely devoted to God that they could neither be changed or substituted with money or taken back under penalty of death. So when a person offered such a gift to the Lord, it was destroyed on the altar of sacrifice if it was an animal or produce. You couldn't buy it back and keep your main bull or your best sheep or whatever. If you made that most holy offering, that offering went on the altar and was completely destroyed. You couldn't get it back in any way. It was totally given up to the service of the Lord if it was a person. Now we have an example of that. Remember Hannah? Hannah who was barren, was not, having, was not able to have children and she begged God to have a child and God you know, she said, if you, give me, if you give me a child, I'll devote him to you. I'll make him as a most devoted, a most holy vow. And she did have a child, right? She had Samuel. And what did she do after he was weaned and so on and so forth? She brought him to the temple and Samuel uh, served the Lord at the temple for the rest of his life. In other words, she gave him up to the service of the temple. And in doing this, do you realize, in doing this, Hannah was giving up her future security. It wasn't just giving up the joy of having her only child. She was also giving up, her, it's like giving up your social security. It's like saying, Lord, from here on in, my social security check, I'm just going to sign it over to you. Because that's what Samuel was. Not only her first child, but her her, her, her security for the future. If you read the story, of course, you realize that she had more children after that. And so she, most, she made a most holy vow in offering her child. And uh, he served, uh, Samuel served Eli for life when he was just a little boy. That's where he started. So hers was a most holy offering. So the most holy offering was the supreme act of the will in giving over to God the complete possession of something that you own without any chance of redeeming it or using it again. And so through the tithes, through the firstborn dedications, through the votive offerings, and then through the most holy offerings, the Jews progressed in their understanding of two very important ideas. Because you see, it's not like God needs stuff. He doesn't need stuff. You know, the act of giving Him things at different levels Right? God is using those levels to teach us something. And the Jews going through these four different levels of giving, there were two important lessons that they learned. First of all, they learned and understood that God created and owned all things. Everything was His to begin with. And so their giving was a reflection of that understanding. And secondly, their closeness to God increased as they practiced the spiritual exercise of giving. I mean, there was a process to it. First, 
they gave him what was commanded, the tithes, the firstborn. Well, that, that was submission. They submitted to the law of giving. Then they gave a token amount based on what they had left. That was a votive offering, right? Well, now they went from, they went from submission to sacrifice, because they had to sacrifice to give the votive offering. And then they offered to reduce the portion that they had left by totally giving up something that they possessed. For example, by totally giving an animal for destruction and sacrifice, instead of, a, of cash value, they lost the entire value and the potential income from that animal. See what I'm saying? When they made something most holy to the Lord, they themselves became poorer because of it. They risked economic security to do it. When they, did, when they were at this level of giving, what they were actually doing was surrendering to God. Surrendering to Him. So their giving led them through three steps of spiritual growth. The first level was submission. The second level, sacrifice. And the final level, the highest level, was surrender. Now, this system also taught them another and a more difficult lesson, and it is this. This system taught them that there was a limit to the closeness that they could come to God because there was a limit to their giving. If being one with God required giving all, then how could you achieve it? No matter how much you wanted to give, how much you wanted to dedicate as most holy, I mean, you still had to live, you still had to eat, you still had to care for your family. In the end, the person who thirsted for complete holiness and dedication through the method of giving learned that it was always, oh, it was just out of reach. I think all of us have heard the story about, I, I think it's true, I, so many people told me that's about the, a brother who, you know, who was a businessman and with time he started giving 10% and 20% of his income and he became wealthy, 30%, 50%, and at the end he was given 90% of his income to the Lord and keeping 10% for himself. And I remember hearing that story, wow, what great faith this man has, how generous he is, well, how holy he is. But it dawned on me also, yeah, but he still had that 10%. As much as he wanted to give everything to the Lord, he still had that 10% because he had to eat. He had to take care of himself. Yes, God owned everything. Yes, man wanted to be wholly devoted to God. Yes, but it was in all practicality impossible to achieve in this way. In essence, a person would have to give up his home, his property, all of his livestock and then turn over his family for service and even then he himself had to survive. No, these, these rules, this system only whetted the appetite for personal devotion to God but it didn't really satisfy it. The ability to be wholly devoted to God in a physical and spiritual way only became possible with the coming of Jesus Christ into this world. And so we think about the idea of being wholly devoted to God through Christ. Paul describes this process of complete dedication in his letter to the Romans. The apostle not only says that it is possible, he actually urges his readers to make of their lives a sacrifice that is, quote, wholly devoted or most holy to God. Now that you understand the idea of most holy and how it fit into the Jewish life and how this represented their giving pattern, perhaps you'll get a better understanding of Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12 verse one, Paul says, I urge you brethren by the mercies of God, listen, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. What kind of sacrifice? What kind of giving? A holy giving, a whole giving, a, a, an entire gift, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And so today, God goes beyond the rules and regulations of the Old Testament concerning tithes and firstborn and 
offerings and most holy offerings, we go even beyond that. He states plainly that what he wants is not 10%, or a firstborn child, or even the complete sacrifice of a portion of your wealth. Today, God wants you. You know, we're always fussing over this idea of uh, how much am I going to give, 2%, 5%, wow, I'm giving 10%, man, I'm really doing it, I'm, uh, I'm going to try, 2015, I'm going to try to give 11.5%. You're not getting it. You're not getting it. What God wants is you. He wants all of you. He's willing to offer you something not possible in the Old Testament times, and that's an intimate relationship with Himself. But He requires that you offer yourself as a most holy sacrifice in order to receive this privilege. Now the problem here is that even if you were willing to do this, you are an unworthy candidate. You see, sacrifices totally devoted to the Lord had to be without defect or blemish in order to be acceptable. A quick review of our lives and deeds will show that, well, we're far from being pure and we're far from being without defect. Thankfully, God provides a worthy sacrifice in our place through Jesus Christ. So Paul explains this in Romans 5.8 when he says, but God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So in offering His perfect life on the cross, Christ makes possible the thing that mankind has sought after for so long. And what is that, you say? That is oneness with God through a complete offering of yourself. I repeat it, oneness with God through a complete offering of self. By fulfilling the requirement for a perfect sacrifice, Christ has made it possible for us to come before God and make a, not a tithe of ourselves, a percentage of ourselves, not a votive offering, but a complete total offering of ourselves to God. Now in the Old Testament, most holy offerings were completely destroyed or completely devoted to the surface of God. In the New Testament, when we present ourselves as a most holy offering to the Lord, we do both. First of all, we are completely destroyed. You say, completely destroyed? How am I completely destroyed? Well, the Bible says that through baptism, we experience the death of our old man of sin. Let's read that. Romans chapter six, beginning in verse three, he says, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore we have been buried with Him through baptism into death. So the most holy sacrifice in the Old Testament, they took it, they killed it, they burned it, completely destroyed it. It was dead, it was gone. In the New Testament, we're the most holy sacrifice that we're offering of ourselves to God. How do we die? We die in the waters of baptism, completely dead. The old man completely gone, all gone, finished, right? Not only are we completely destroyed, but we are also completely dedicated to a new life, a life united to God through Christ. We keep reading verse four, he says, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. In addition to this, we have the privilege and the joy to make a most holy offering of ourselves, listen, each and every day by renewing our faith in Christ through obedience and service in His name. This is something that the Jews could not even imagine. The ongoing presentation of ourselves as wholly devoted sacrifices to God each and every day forever. Forever. What they could not accomplish even one time we as Christians are able to do 
every single day of our lives through faith in Jesus Christ. What a joy, what grace, how blessed we are in Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. We don't realize these things. Our true life is in the spirit and God has given us this incredible, incredible joy to offer, to actually give Him something. You know, you meet somebody who's, a, I don't know, a superstar, the governor, you meet the governor and you say, well, I grew these tomatoes, you know, uh, and, and you go to the governor and you meet her and say, look, I've, I've grown these beautiful tomatoes, I'd like you to have them. And she said, oh, thank you, how kind, right? We see big, important, famous people, somehow we want to give them something. But the living God, we don't give him tomatoes, we don't offer him sheep, we don't offer him a bull, we're able to give him ourselves. Imagine how happy you are that the great person accepts your small gift, how good that makes you feel. How good do you think you feel if what you're offering is yourself to Almighty God and He accepts it day after day after day after day into eternity. And so today I, I've given you some background information about the dedication of things that we make to God because we're often required or moved to offer ourselves to the Lord through our service to His church. On this day, each of us has an opportunity to move into a much more intimate relationship with God through their tangible service to His body, the church. Don't be left out. Don't be held back for any reason. Today the Lord is calling you into a deeper and fuller commitment to following Him. So I make more invitations, as if we've not had invitations today. I make some more. If you have not confessed your faith publicly, repented sincerely, been baptized properly by immersion, then come forth to confess your faith in Him now and be saved. And if you were a Christian but you have neglected your faith and compromised your behavior, neglected the church and its work, then you need to be restored. And if you are burdened by guilt or fear or worry and need the prayers of the church, and the elders certainly come for that. We're ready to minister to you. And finally, if you want to give God a more perfect and wholly devoted offering of yourself, and you need help in knowing how to do that, then please come as we stand and our sing, and we sing our song of, of invitation and encouragement so that all of us can make a holy, devoted offering of ourselves today, tonight, and forevermore.